back to Cornell and went to graduate school in engineering physics. And I got my degree and my master's and then my PhD at Cornell using this phenomenon where an electron hits any kind of electrons, which is used in the photomultiplier tubes that open doors. When we walk up to a certain door and it automatically opens, there's a light beam that detects our presence and uh, as we are released and the secondary electron multiplies it and it sends a signal to open the door. And that's what we were doing. So I was interested in the application of physics and in, in, in practical things like one was to um, improve the uh, ability to take x-ray pictures or fluoroscopy with less radiation because we were using a lot of radiation during fluoroscopy. In a fluorescent screen you stand there and they look at you for a few minutes maybe and you get an enormous dose and so it so happened that I was able to work on a big image intensifier that cut the dose in fluoroscopy by a hundred to two hundred fold and that was done at the Westinghouse Research Lab because they heard me give a talk on my work at Cornell and uh, they asked me to come to work on the research uh, of uh, electron physics for imaging tubes. It's interesting because that was a very satisfying kind of work. It allowed me to think that I could help to reduce many unnecessary x-rays which produce a risk of cancer. And uh, so early in life uh, I had been encouraged to do that by someone who um, I never would have expected it from, but it was Albert Einstein, the famous professor, who um, received the Nobel Prize in 1905, well, for his work that he did in 1905 to, um, you know, to develop the special theory of relativity. His study was also included the process where a light beam hits a metal plate and knocks out an electron. And so um, someone, a professor I knew, distant relative who asked me why don't you write a letter to Einstein about how your theory that you're trying to develop is related to his theory on the photoelectric effect for which he won a Nobel Prize. And so I wrote him a letter and he invited me to come to Princeton and uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to talk with him about my work and, <laughs> and he was such a nice gentle old man at the time he was already almost 70 and, uh, and I was only 23, and, uh, but he asked me whether I could still speak German since I was born in Germany and was interested in physics. He said, let's talk in German, it's easier for me. And so we sat down and talked, and would you believe, I couldn't believe it. Sometimes the secretary would come in and he said, Dr. Einstein, there's someone waiting for you. Or he said, could you, um, you know, the, would you like, you know, me to tell you this, the other things you need to do. And he said, no, no, be right back. And he came back and we talked for five hours. And that, in effect, had an enormous effect on my life because, among things, he encouraged me to pursue my theory and I finally got it all published. And uh, then he also told me, let's go for a walk. I want to talk to you some more about your ideas on the nature of the fundamental particles of the universe, which were just being discovered. New particles were being discovered in cosmic rays, and it was a very interesting time, but there were some new particles that were much heavier than the electron, but less heavy than the proton, and, and they were disintegrating in an instant, but nobody knew what they were composed of. And I had the idea that since they all decayed into electrons, and I was always interested in electrons anyhow, I thought maybe the whole universe, is, this is the only truly fundamental particle, the electron and its opposite uh, partner, the positron that had the same mass but the opposite, uh, opposite um, charge. And he said, well, he said, um, keep on thinking about these things. And so he encouraged me to pursue this, but he said, look, don't go back into academia. They will kill every bit of originality out of you. <laughs> In order to become a full professor, you have to get approved on every level. And you cannot question the existing ideas too much or else you won't get promoted. So Einstein said, 
have a shoemaker's job for the rest of your life, so that you can do something useful uh, for humanity, you know, and don't make the mistake I made. I accepted a position in Berlin where I had nothing to do but to solve the mystery of the universe, and nobody can do that. And therefore, you should do that in the evenings and have a day job <laughs> when you can <laughs> work and do something really useful for humanity. And he was absolutely right. It allowed me to accept a position, uh, you know, in the research lab at the Westinghouse Research uh, Laboratory in Churchill that had just been built when I was finished with graduate school, and they invited me to come. And I used my work that Einstein encouraged me to do to develop a new kind of camera tube. In fact, it's called the SEC Viticon, and it was used by NASA to take the pictures that went along on the moon, to the moon, in 1969 and took the pictures of people stepping on the moon for the first time. And everybody in the world saw the pictures with what I felt with my camera tube, which is very nice because our group developed it at Westinghouse and, and it gave me a great deal of satisfaction. And then later on, uh, the same tube that was sensitive to the ultraviolet light coming from the distant universe was used in the first orbiting uh, small observatory that was just like the Hubble but much smaller and it gave us the first pictures in the ultraviolet light from distant stars, the most distant stars, billion, 13, 20, 15 billion years away. 15 billion years they took to travel to reach our camera tube. So, and we had developed a, a telescope that would go on the moon, a small portable telescope, no bigger than a foot in diameter. It would have outperformed the biggest telescope on Earth because there's no atmosphere on the moon. And so I was looking forward to it and then the Vietnam War cut it all off because the Vietnam War caused the NASA budget to be cut and we stopped working and we couldn't get another mission to the moon to set up the telescope that would have really given us a very early picture of what was going on in the beginning of the universe, how stars were formed and planets were formed, everything. And then later on came the Hubble, and the Hubble would have had my camera on it, but by that time uh, new uh, solid-state television tubes were developed, the kind that we're using right now here in this room to talk about, to, to record what I'm saying. They're tiny little devices that make miniature cameras possible, and that meant that my SEC Viticon was no longer needed. <laughs> but it was a pioneer in terms of sending back pictures from, from the moon and from other, other stars. It's been used on other telescopes in the world, but not on the Hubble telescope.